Here are some uh, cost concepts and terms that one needs to revise in order to be prepared for the uh, exam. One is a cost unit. The idea of a cost unit would be um, the defining the item or the quantity that one wants to measure the cost of. Now for most products, so automobiles, refrigerators, and so on, the cost unit would be the product itself. However, if you're uh, in the food industry, for example, um, and you want to uh, determine the cost, uh, production cost of potato chips, you won't do it uh, by a monetary cost per potato chip. You probably do it by some weight measure, like uh, grams or kilograms and so on. And if uh, we're talking about toothpicks or nails and other things, we would think of those in terms of batches. In other words, uh, uh, a certain a uh, hundred or nails a batch of nails would have a would be the unit and the cost of that batch would be the um, the basis on which we would um, measure track record and budget uh, costs or the item could be for example in services could be the uh, cost of a student of uh, providing services to a student as a cost unit now the cost center idea is the head, the, the manager in charge of a cost center is, has as his principal responsibility the control of costs at that center. He's not generating revenues. If he were responsible for revenue generation, let's say a sales team for example, then we would speak of that uh, unit of organization as being a revenue center. You can see here that the focus or the priority of the, or the uh, issue that's within the control of the manager respectively would be a cost or would be revenues. If we move up the scale to the to a profit center, a profit center involves both the generation of, co of revenues and some measure of cost or expense control in order to maximize profits. Therefore, profit center, uh, the head of a profit center is responsible for um, both dimensions, increasing revenues and keeping costs under control. We can get even more sophisticated and talk about investment centers. Investment centers, the uh, responsibility is not limited to current revenues and expenses, but also to long-term investments, also known as capital expenditures, and that has to be factored into the equation. The other area is uh, to think about performance measures. What is an appro appropriate performance measure given the kind of uh, organizational unit we're talking about? If we're talking about cost centers, then clearly we're looking at the, we need to have performance measures which focus on cost control. And of course, if we're looking at revenue centers, we're also looking, we're, we're, we're focusing on sales targets being achieved. And remember, it depends on how those sales are achieved, what level of risk is being adopted at the revenue center. In the case of a profit center, then we need to budget and monitor the performance and, and progress with regard to um, profits. And uh, we can also measure profit margins. That would be a percentage expression of, of uh, profitability. And finally, if we move to investment centers and how do we uh, measure the performance of an investment center, there we're looking at uh, the return which is achieved on capital employed. This would be the long-term resources which are at the disposal of the center. And the question here is, how well are they able to generate um, uh, financial returns based on the investments that have been made or have been dedicated to that particular investment center? Other methods are known as residual income, and there are a variety of um, measures with regard to asset turnover uh, that one can use as an indicator whether an investment center is performing um, as expected or not. Let's move on to the uh, issue of recording costs. This is um, sort of more technical um, bookkeeping now. Um, the candidate has to be 
familiar with the uh, debit and credit system, you can see your debit entries and credit entries for handling um, or accounting for materials. Um, if you can visualize a balance sheet where assets would be on one side of the balance sheet and liabilities on the other, when we increase our um, materials account, we would debit materials and therefore that would indicate an increase in materials. Let's just take a T account, make a debit of $1,000 worth of materials that have been purchased. And there you have it. It's a debit. Very, very straightforward. Um, also worth mentioning that obviously if we remove uh, materials we would be reducing the this balance 1000 by applying credits to the to the uh, T account so $500 credit would indicate a reduction of the balance one from 1000 down to to 500 okay just keep in mind debits and credits they're uh, practice makes perfect in these in these uh, cases uh, methods of inventory valuation uh, keep in mind that there are different methods first in first out um, inventory valuation uh, if you think about your inventory and the things that go in and come out of the inventory uh, the first items to go in at a particular cost would be the first ones to be removed from the inventory. And LIFO, last in, first out, would would suggest that the last item that goes into the inventory is the first that is coming out. You can think of the inventory in the LIFO case as being a box where you're putting things in from the top. So the things at the bottom stay in the bottom, and the last in is at the top, and therefore comes out first from a uh, valuation point of view. Um, the other methods to be reviewed are periodic and weighted average uh, methods. This is just a, uh, a reminder of the different methods that one has to uh, uh, know about. Now the accounting for labor costs, if we look at the T account, um, debits uh, expenses are associated with debits and therefore debit entries would be uh, picking up and recording labor costs incurred now at the end of a period we want to um, close out the labor account and therefore the labor costs incurred would be transferred to our profit and loss account profit and loss account through a debit to profit and loss account how do we achieve this? Well, if we have a debit balance in our labor account to begin with, you can see that here, the way you close out that account would be to credit the labor account by the balance, the full balance of labor costs incurred, so that the debits and credits will equal, will balance each other, and therefore the, the uh, labor account will have effectively been reduced to a zero balance. A credit to the labor balance is offset by a equal debit to the profit and loss T account. And this is how the transfer is, is affected. Um, with regard to labor costs, there are two um, main remuneration methods one has to, um, uh, should consider. One is time-based, being paid based on uh, the amount of time that one works and output based also known as piecework which is uh, traditionally in the garment uh, business clothing business is to pay workers according to the number of units produced you can see here that there are pros and cons in these two methods and therefore it's good to think about what the implications are also from uh, employee motivation. Remember, a business is made up of people, and people only work well, according to some theories, if they are basically um, motivated and inspired to work well. And therefore, the type, the system of remuneration has to be adapted to the circumstances in order to get the most out of the 
staff. Okay, we've uh, briefly touched on uh, recording or uh, cost recordings for materials and for labor. Um, let's just spend a moment to talk about other expenses. Now let's just think about this for a minute in terms of other expenses. If we're not talking about materials that go into a product, we're not talking about labor, people who work to produce that product. Let's take something which is falling completely outside these two categories. Let's take rent, for example, or utilities, the uh, heat and the water and so on that keep a factory running. These costs tend to be general sort of overhead costs, indirect costs, if you will, and relating those costs to specific units of output is not so simple. We uh, encountered this problem uh, or this issue earlier when we talked about uh, relating fixed overhead costs to units of output on the cost card when we were talking about absorption costing. So it's basically the same challenge or the same issue here. How do we intelligently relate uh, something like rent, which is a big lump sum per month, which is paid for the factory? How do we relate that to individual units of output? And that's, that's the challenge that we're faced with here. So in order to do this, let's just keep in mind um, that accountants like to relate costs of production to the items being produced. In other words, the units of output themselves. And we've said that the direct costs are really not a problem because they are, remember that term, directly attributable to the product, especially materials and labor. We also had uh, direct um, expenses such as we encountered an example earlier, which was for example, royalties or perhaps uh, some kind of license uh, payment arrangements on a per unit basis, i.e. directly attributable. The problem begins when we get into the indirect costs, or as we refer to them as overhead costs, and making the link between these overheads and output. And this, this becomes the challenge that we want to uh, discuss to see how absorption costing actually works. Have a look at this, what we can say this is kind of a roadmap which links the total production costs in a factory ultimately to a cost per unit. This becomes our finish line here. And the road there takes us through a number of steps here with regard to indirect costs. Direct costs are no problem because, as we said, they can be directly attributable to the cost unit. And that's not really the, uh, that's, not, that's not of major concern. It's what to do with the indirect costs. And the indirect costs have to be allocated or apportioned to particular cost centers. They have to be split up. Let's say we have two production centers A and B and we also have a service uh, center in the in the which is not directly involved in production it could be the uh, restaurant that feeds the employees it could also be a warehouse with um, uh, parts that have to be used for components or raw materials and so on all of these units in the factory uh, need to shoulder or take over assume a certain uh, amount of the overhead costs. The question is, how do we split up this amount? And then, how do we, in order to relate those overhead costs ultimately to cost units, we need to do a, a, to a, a multi-step process of taking the service center costs, which are not handling the output directly, and move their costs to the production centers. You can see here if we have $1,000 of costs, the idea is to find some apportionment basis of breaking up that 1000 so that they can be distributed among A, B, and C on some basis which is considered fair. Let's say it's $400 for A, $200 for 
B and now let's make it $300 for B and $300 for C. That should add up to 1000 so we don't gain or lose any costs along the way. And the next step is going to be how do we take the 300 of C and split those costs up between A and B so that they ultimately shoulder the costs. And finally, how do we relate or absorb those costs uh, into particular cost units?